everyone. Hope you're doing well today. This video is going to begin a series where we introduce an approach to ethics that is diametrically opposed to the consequentialist and utilitarian perspective that we've already looked at. We're going to start out the video just by reflecting intuitively on some cases and the potential moral importance of consistency and fairness. And then this will lead us into a discussion of Kant's principle of universalizability. And then we'll consider some cases and examples. And then we'll talk about two different kinds of contradictions that occur when we are trying to apply the principle of universalizability to various cases. So let's start out just by considering a couple examples of behavior here. So imagine a person who decides not to pay their taxes, even though they have the money, because they'd rather use that money to pay for a vacation. Or imagine a student who cheats on an exam to get a better grade. Or imagine a person who's stuck in a traffic jam and decides, you know what, I'm done with this. And they pull into the emergency lane and fly down the highway to get around that traffic jam. Or yet again, imagine a student in a group project who decides that they're just going to make all the other students do the work for that project so that they can skip it and go to a party and enjoy themselves instead. Now, in all of these cases, you might think that the person has done something immoral. But now, does your judgment that what they did here was moral or immoral depend on how you're thinking about the consequences of these actions? Imagine somehow they figure out a way to avoid negative consequences, and so they get the benefit of the vacation or the better grade or the fun at the party or getting to their job quicker getting around that traffic jam. You might think they that benefit was stolen, in a sense, from other people. It took advantage of other people. It was unfair, and they made an exception of themselves by expecting other people to be playing by the rules while making an exception such that they allowed themselves to break those rules that they were expecting others to follow. You might think that all these people ought to be acting in a way that is consistent with the rules that they expect other people to follow. You might think that they ought to show a bit more integrity where they're willing to follow the rules of paying their taxes, of staying in the regular lanes, even when it comes at a cost to themselves. They miss out on that vacation or they get to work a little bit later and they lose time. You think they ought to show that kind of integrity of sticking to those rules that they expect others to follow, even when it comes at a cost of themselves. Kant attempts to develop an ethical theory where he puts those ideas of acting fairly and in a consistent way and with integrity at the foundation of morality instead of trying to understand morality in terms of the consequences or results of our actions. All right, so Kant believed that morality consisted of a set of imperatives or commands, certain duties that we have to follow independent of the good or bad results. Now, when we talk about commands, commands can come in two forms. They could be hypothetical, where it's something of the form, if A, do this action. Or they could come in a categorical form that just say, do this action. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Now, we'll talk about this idea of hypothetical versus categorical imperatives in a lot more detail in another video, but I just wanted to at least introduce the idea initially here because Kant thought that morality consisted of categorical imperatives. The duties, the commands of morality say, don't steal, don't kill. They don't say, if you care about other people, don't kill. There's no hypothetical nature to these commands. So, that moral command that says don't kill is a categorical command that's going to apply to everybody regardless of what they want or desire. But those specific commands of morality, such as don't kill, don't steal, etc., they actually derive from a single more general command that morality gives us. And so that more fundamental, that foundational command of morality is what Kant calls the categorical imperative. Now, the categorical imperative, unlike other commands, it doesn't come to us from any authority figure. It's not our government telling us, do this. It's not our parents telling us, do this. It's not a teacher telling a student to do this, to write a paper. 
The categorical imperative, these demands of morality, don't come from another person telling us to do these things, but rather these categorical imperatives are commands that come from within us, from within our own nature as rational creatures. It's our own reason that commands us to do these things. And so because of that, the moral law is going to apply to all of us equally insofar as we each have reason. So I have reason, and so the moral law applies to me. I have to not kill. You have reason, and so the moral law applies to you. You have to not kill, regardless of what your wants and desires are. So that's very different than something like a law of a country. The laws of a country only apply to people that live in that country. They don't apply to everyone, but the moral law applies to anybody insofar as they have reason. Kant gave several formulations of the categorical imperative. So he thought there was one principle, but he thought there was multiple ways of expressing that principle. Now, currently, we're just going to focus on his first formulation. This is what's called the principle of universalizability. And it says that an action is morally permissible if and only if it's possible for you to rationally will that its maxim becomes a universal law. In order to understand this principle, this formulation, we need to get clear about a couple things. What exactly is a maxim? What would it mean for a maxim to be a universal law? And what would it mean for us to be able to rationally will the maxim to become a universal law. These are the things we need to get clear on to make sure we understand what this principle is actually proposing. Let's start with this idea of a maxim. Kant thought that every action has a maxim where this is a principle that we give to ourselves that then guides or underlies our individual behavior. All right? So we don't just act randomly. We aren't just robots. Rather, there are principles that we choose to live by, and those principles guide the actions that we perform. And so these principles, you can think of as things that state an action, the circumstances of when that action will be done, and the purpose or reasons for that action. So a maxim here is not just a statement of what you intend to do. In order to state what your maxim is, you need to say what you intend to do, the conditions you're going to do it, and your reasoning behind the action for why you intend to do it. If morality depends on an action's maxim, then we need to distinguish between the moral and the immoral maxims. Now, Kant's view is that the good maxims are the ones that we are able to universalize. They are universalizable. We can rationally will that those maxims become universal law. So Kant's idea is that the maxims guiding our actions will be morally acceptable when it's possible for us to apply that same maxim to everyone equally without contradicting ourselves. So to take a maxim and apply it to everyone, including ourselves, that's the idea of making the maxim universal. You are applying it universally to everyone. To be able to do that without contradicting ourselves, that's the idea of rationally willing this to become universal law. Because you can't rationally will a contradiction. Contradictions are irrational. And so if willing the universalization of the maxim would end up contradicting ourselves, we thereby can't rationally will for that maxim to become universal law. Putting this together, this is how you might want to go about testing whether a maxim is universalizable. First thing you need to do is figure out what your maxim is. State what you intend to do, the circumstances you intend to do it, and the reasoning for why you intend to do it. Then try to imagine a world where not only you, but everybody supports and always acts on that same maxim. And then once you've imagined that world, ask yourself, is there any contradiction in my willing or choosing such a world? If there is that kind of contradiction, then the maxim is not universalizable. But if there is no contradiction in willing such a world, then the maxim is universalizable and it's okay to act on. 
So the idea behind this is that when you act on a maxim that's not universalizable, that means the principle that you are using to guide your own actions is one that you are not able to will that everyone else follow as well. And that means that you are making an exception of yourself. You are expecting that other people won't act on the maxim that you are utilizing, but you are allowing yourself to be the exception to the rule where you can follow this maxim that you have adopted. And that is unfair to others. Your principle is inconsistent in that way. And maybe that shows that your principle is irrational and immoral. Let's see how this works by looking at a previous case that we looked at that caused some problems for utilitarianism. That organ harvesting case where the doctor has five patients dying of organ failure and they would be able to save the five if they were to harvest the organs of the healthy person next to them. It looks like the utilitarian has to say that this is morally acceptable because it would get better consequences overall. But Kant would say, well, look, it's not the consequences we should be looking at. We need to look at the maxim underlying the action. Here, it looks like the doctor's maxim would be something of the form, when more people are dying, then I'll kill one healthy person in order to save more lives. But now I want you to imagine a world where everybody adopts that same maxim and follows and supports that same maxim. Would the doctor be able to act on this same maxim in a world where everybody adopts it? No. This would lead to a contradiction in trying to imagine that kind of world and trying to will it to be the case because everybody following that maxim or adopting that maxim would end up undermining, would be a, a form of self-sabotage for the doctor. Because in a world where everybody adopted that maxim, nobody's ever going to go to a doctor unless they're sick. If you're healthy, you're just not going to go to a doctor because you know that the doctor will kill you to save more lives. The doctor could not will that everybody adopt the same maxim because that would self-sabotage and undermine that very action there. And so it looks like this maxim is not universalizable and so the doctor's action is wrong. All right, now let's consider some cases from the reading that we assigned. There's the cases of false promises, stealing, and refusing to ever help others. So in the case of false promises, remember this is something like you need money and so you make a promise to a friend that you'll pay them back knowing that you just have no intention of ever paying them back anyways. And so here it looks like the maxim is something in the form, look, if I need something like money, then I'll make a false promise to get what I need. And imagine you steal from others. Maybe the maxim you're acting on is something like, well, look, if I want something, then I'll steal those things so that I can have the things that I want. Now imagine someone who refuses to ever help another person. It looks like their maxim is something in the form, I will never help anyone else out when they need help. So now let's see, are these maxims universalizable or not? It looks like the false promise one is not. In a world where everybody adopts and supports this maxim and knows about it, promises would lose all meaning. And so you are not able to rationally will a world where everyone adopt that maxim because everyone adopting that maxim would actually undermine the ability to even make a promise in the first place. Same thing with stealing. If everybody were to adopt this maxim, then it is the whole idea of property. If everybody was just taking whatever they want, whenever they want, the idea of property and ownership wouldn't make any sense. And so if there is no property or ownership, if there's no idea of property or ownership, then there's no such thing as stealing either. So you wouldn't be able to steal things that you want. You wouldn't be able to act on that maxim in a world where everybody adopts that maxim because there'd be no property and so there'd be no stealing. Similarly, you can't rationally will a world where nobody ever helps anyone else out when they need help. You can imagine a world where nobody ever helps anybody else, but it is you can't rationally will for such a world to be the case because that would require you willing that other people don't ever help you when you need help. It's irrational for you to will that you won't get what you need. All right? And so you undermine yourself if you were to will that everybody act on this maxim. 
According to Kant, though, there are two kinds of contradictions that might occur when you attempt to will a maxim to become a universal law. There's what's called a contradiction in conception, and there's what's called a contradiction in will. Now, a contradiction is conception is when we cannot even coherently conceive of a world where the maxim is a universal law. This is like what happens in the case of false promising and stealing. When we try to imagine a world where a maxim of false promising is accepted by everyone as universal law, it undermines the very idea that there is such a thing as promising in that world. It's a contradiction in the very conception of that world. A contradiction in will is slightly different. This is when it's impossible for us to rationally will or choose the world we are conceiving of. So we are able to conceive of that world, but we cannot rationally will for that world to be the case. So this is what happens in the case of the maxim that says, I will never help anybody in need. Because I can conceive of a world where nobody ever helps anyone else out. There's no contradiction in the world itself. But if I were to will such a world to be the case, the idea is that would contradict my own will to have the things that I need. Because I'd be willing that I have the things that I need while also willing that other people never help me even when I need it. Those two wills contradict one another, and thus I cannot rationally will that world. These kinds of contradictions also correlate to two kinds of duties that Kant thought we had. There are both perfect or absolute duties, but there's also some imperfect duties. A perfect duty is something you must always do and to the full degree. Kant thought that you had a perfect duty to not to give false promises. And Kant thought that this was because when you consider the maxim behind a false promise and you try to universalize it, it actually contradicts the very idea of there being a institution of promising in the first place. There's a contradiction in that conception of that world. And so you must always follow this law that says, do not make a false promise. Imperfect duties are something you must do it sometimes and you need to do it to some degree. But you have a certain latitude in how you fulfill that duty. You need to do it sometimes, but you don't need to do it all the time. It is up to you, so to speak, when and how you fulfill that duty. This is the example of our duty of beneficence, of helping others in need. We can imagine a world where nobody helps anyone else out. And so there isn't a perfect duty to help others when they are in need. But he thinks there is an imperfect duty because we cannot will that world that we can conceive of, which means that we have to, at the very least, adopt this maxim where we will sometimes help others when they are in need. So there's some latitude in how I fulfill this duty. Now, if I just never help anyone else out, I would have failed to live up to this imperfect duty. But as long as I help other people sometimes to some extent, then I will have fulfilled my duty of beneficence on Kant's theory. So you might think about how that might relate to some of the ideas we talked about regarding charitable giving. What I want to end here with is with some cases for you to do on your own. Consider those cases we started with in this video. I want you to think about what Kant's principle of universalizability would say about each of these cases. So that's all for this video. See you all in the next one. Bye-bye.